Now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. Mentioned uh, interim coach Cadillac Williams earlier, part of the 2004 undefeated Auburn Tigers football team, went 13 and now. Um, four first round draft picks on that team, Joel. You know who they were? Ronnie Brown, who was the other running back who was actually drafted ahead of him. Jason Campbell, and it was a cornerback. I cannot remember his name. Carlos um, Rogers. Carlos Rogers. That's it. Good, yep. uh, good memory. Um, but as you mentioned, Ronnie Brown was the higher drafted running back on that team. And he also had one of the greatest individual games ever, the famous Miami Dolphins Wildcat game, where they just completely ripped the Patriots to shred with Ronnie Brown um, running and throwing from the Wildcat. So I think this is a good moment. We want to celebrate Carnell Cadillac Williams, but we also want to remember his backfield teammate, the great Ronnie Brown. Um, Stefan, what is your Ronnie Brown? I was at Indiana University last week doing some reporting. The university recently acquired an enormous collection of dictionaries and other word-related material. And as I was scanning some shelves, I noticed a title that seemed out of place, A Wife's Guide to Baseball by Charlene Gibson and Michael Rich. Charlene Gibson was Bob Gibson's wife. Michael Rich was a PR guy at Newsweek. Published in 1970, A Wife's Guide to Baseball was part of a series. Rich also co-wrote A Wife's Guide to Pro Basketball with Jane West, Jerry's wife, and A Wife's Guide to Pro Football with Elaine Tarkenton, Fran's wife. The cover of Gibson's book showed a woman's hands, rings on multiple fingers, a bracelet on a wrist, holding a baseball bat. The premise was about as sexist as you'd imagine. Women can't handle the complexities of sports, so here's the wife of an actual athlete to explain the basics. And so was the public response. Sports Illustrated wrote that a man who takes his wife to a game might find her while all hell is breaking loose a field, ten seats over, asking a perfect stranger where she purchased those adorable maxi pants. Columnist Dick Young of the New York Daily News wrote, Get this book for your little lady, and maybe she will look at you with less suspicion when you talk in your sleep about a bang-bang play. Ugh. One more, Rex Lardner reviewing the book favorably in the New York Times. Can these ladies ever catch up? They play baseball kind of funny, if at all, and because of glands, etc., are more likely to be enchanted by the colors of the visiting team's uniforms than by the spearing of a liner. Oh my God, these men, and well, men. Just the worst. A Wife's Guide to Baseball itself wasn't written in a condescending style. The 178-page book is a position-by-position position and rule-by-rule rule account of the game. Bob Gibson added footnotes and comments about pitching. In a foreword, Commissioner Bowie Kuhn's wife, Louisa, said that society was changing and women, once discouraged by a hostile male attitude from following baseball, were more welcome now. On the other hand, the byline on her words was Mrs. Bowie Kuhn. In a year when Mr. Bowie Kuhn tried to ban pitcher Jim Bouton's raucous tell-all ball four, a wife's guide to baseball was MLB-sanctioned marketing. But Charlene Gibson wanted to discomfort readers at least a little on the subject of race. She was no civil rights radical. One interviewer described her as a just-out-of-the-lamp genie who, in a fluid burnt orange jumpsuit and gold necklaces, cast a spell. And she doesn't describe in the book her own history growing up in a poor neighborhood in Omaha or how Bob Gibson suffered racial abuse in the minors in the Jim Crow South and early in his major league career, where his first manager with the Cardinals, Solly Hemis, freely hurled racial epithets at black players to motivate them, as recounted in a 2018 story in The Undefeated, and demeaned Gibson's intellect by telling his pitcher not to bother attending pregame strategy meetings. That piece also noted that in 1968, when he won 22 games, posted a 1.12 ERA, and struck out 268 batters, plus 17 more in Game 1 of the World Series, Gibson pitched through anger over the assassination of Martin Luther King, anger that he shared with other black players on the team, including Lou Brock and Kurt Flood, and white players like Tim McCarver, who said later that Gibson schooled him about racism throughout that season. 
It's in that personal context and the broader social one, too, that Charlene Gibson tiptoed in a book marketed at white women into telling a few truths about race and sports. Sure, baseball has made progress since Jackie Robinson broke the color line 23 years ago, she wrote, but it didn't really amount to much. For instance, why did newspapers feel the need to constantly write about black and white players rooming together on the road? So what, she said. Baseball is highly contradictory, Charlene Gibson wrote. Race was only an issue, she pointed out, when the uniforms came off. Partly, she said, it is an issue because black ball players love the game every bit as much as white ball players do, but unlike whites, have no opportunity to manage in the major leagues or to have a significant front office job or something similar. Take that, Mr. and Mrs. Bowie Kuhn. Baseball has been good to the Gibsons, Charlene Gibson concluded, and we love the game, not for what it has done for us, but for what it is. Anyway, it would be five years before Frank Robinson managed the team in Cleveland, and 52 years later, we're still talking about the paucity of black American players, managers, and executives in Major League Baseball. That's great, Stefan. What a uh, find. You hadn't heard of this before uh, you encountered it, I presume? I had not. No. The collection did not include the uh, Mrs. West and Mrs. Tarkenton's books, alas. So, Stefan, it sounds like this ruined your dictionary research. You got obsessed with this really fascinating book about baseball. <laughs> there were like 865 boxes of books in this room. So this was a, a brief diversion from poking through uh, the, this collection. Has, has Charlene Gibson written any other books since then? Because it sounds like she's got some good to great stories, possibly, that uh, might be worth hearing in full. Well, I, my takeaway was mostly, Joel, that I really wish I could have heard Charlene Gibson talk unvarnished about being the wife of a hugely successful black player um, and a woman who was sort of featured on like women's pages and society pages as a sort of pillar of the community and a woman of means. Um, but what she really thought about baseball and how the sport treated black players um, sort of hints through in the, 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 the four pages that she spent talking about race in this book. Yeah, I mean, one thing about it, man, is that uh, wives uh, have as good or better, uh, or partners uh, are good about like what that environment is like for them. And they have the ability to talk with a little bit more freedom than even the players do, right? So and I guess it's uh, probably too late. I assume she is uh, not, no longer with She's us. She's no longer but, with uh, us, yeah. Oh, well, too bad about that. That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. To listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out, go to slate.com slash hangup and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Joel Anderson and Stefan Fatsis, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zelmo Beatty and thanks for listening.